<laughs> it would be hilarious if we did actually saw it in half and send it though wouldn't it no. i know you'd have to pay double postage but yeah i think we should seriously consider this for a moment so i i wouldn't not cut it in half i'll say that <laughs> no we're not. it would be such a bad voltage competition price we've got half of an endless <laughs> episode 12 of season 2 of Bad Voltage coming to you on yeah. Thursday the yeah. 29th of June 2017 yeah. Yeah. I'm Stuart Langridge with me are John O'Bacon and Jeremy Garcia what have we got on this show chaps no Brian Lunduk <laughs> and <laughs> we have uh, we're going to be talking about hacking back um, there is a the active cyber defense certainty act which is the ACDC act let there be rock um, is going to be uh, is going to be the subject of our discussion. Is it okay to hack someone back if they've hacked you? And then Benjamin Mako Hill recently did a study about a little bit of gamification that they did for new members of Wikipedia and whether or not that had the impact they thought that it would. And we had one billion entries for our competition last time uh, to create a conceptual Alexa skill or a, a, a home assistant skill. We had loads and loads and loads of people enter, and we're going to pick a winner and send them an endless mission one. Okay, Google. And now, bad voltage. It's on mute, dude. It's on mute. <laughs> News. <laughs> what? Through the news. <laughs> what the hell yeah. was that? <laughs> that was the uh, bad voltage sound effects department, is what that was. <laughs> well, Not many sound effects in the bad voltage sound effects department. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, if anyone ever comes to you and says, Are you a Foley artist? Your job is to say, No, no, I'm not. I look forward to the open source VST plugin for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. All right. Ah, ah, oh, nearly choked on something. Uh, that is <laughs> sound effects. Sure. Uh, why don't I kick off to get the, uh, get the news going? Go with the news. Um, so it turns out that recently, uh, on Tuesday, in fact, um, uh, Google were dealt a $2.7 billion blow um, in an antitrust ruling in Europe. Um, apparently, this has got something to do with... with um, they're like Google shopping, kind of looking up the prices of different things kind of deal. And they've been basically told to knock that shit off uh, and give us loads of money um, because you were all naughty for, for this antitrust stuff. Um, of course, this gets back to the we've, we've talked about our views on antitrust before. Um, uh, but what do you guys think about this? Um, as far as I can tell, the EU are the only... Um, organization in the world prepared to do something other than just roll over and go fine a bunch of californian firms are allowed to own everything and we don't even mind so well done <laughs> sure fact. yeah I'll, I'll admit i didn't read up, up enough on this one to have a good opinion i did see though that it's double the previous highest claim ever so pretty significant fine um yeah, yeah i mean it, it, it is big but i think a large point a large um aspect of that is just kind of essentially essentially inflation you know Right, um, firms have got more money than they used to have. It goes up. It goes up every year. So, in order to do anything which has any effect on someone as huge as Google, it's got to be a really, really big, expensive fine. Otherwise, you know, you go, okay, Google, we're going to find you a hundred million dollars, and they'll be like, okay, whatever. We'll whatever. Just, we'll that just, was lunch. We'll just, yesterday. We'll, <laughs> we'll just pay that every day in order to keep doing this. Right. This is like, um, you know, when Apple said, uh, yeah, we're not going to unlock the iPhone. And the and the government went well. No, they, but we're going to fine you. And they went fine. We'll eat the fine because <laughs> we'd rather do that than compromise it. This is a kind what, of principle, right? What I find interesting about this is that, from what I can tell, the antitrust ruling was related to this you know, shopping, comparing prices business. Um, yes, but not related to the fact that Google basically owns the search engine market and the email market and the calendar market. <laughs> <laughs> like the monopoly is considerably larger than that tiny bit of it from what i can tell it, it is but you've got to have um the the issue is not just owning a lot of the market is in itself not illegal 
right? Um, the whole point of the, the Monopolies and Mergers Commission as was um, antitrust rules in general are it's whether you are unfairly using your dominance in one sphere to push your products in other spheres. Which So the reason Microsoft got busted for it was because they were massively dominant with Windows, but... And, they, and so we're going to bundle Internet Explorer and essentially took over the browser market, which they wouldn't have done if there'd been fair competition. Right? Well, it, you could it, have installed another browser using, you could have used, you could have done what everybody did, which was use Internet Explorer once, install Netscape Navigator, and then you're good. No, you see, that's exactly the point. They went from nothing and didn't compete fairly by saying, OK, here's our competition to the existing dominant player, Netscape. They went, we're just going to stick a copy on every machine that comes out. So everyone went from, I have to download a web browser, which is really hard, when you haven't got a browser to download it with, to, oh, I've just got this one, fine, no problem. And but that's, how is deemed, that that's, de- that's deemed as being unfair. Um, using your dominance di- in one market to take over another. Just being dominant is not in itself a problem. Right, but what I don't understand is, how is that different here? Surely people can go and look up prices elsewhere. Right? I mean, G- Google are not stopping anyone doing it. No, no, no. Uh, not stopping anyone providing an alternative option. Microsoft. This is one of the reasons why I think this Andrew stuff. No, no, stuff hang on, hang on. The reason, like, the reason they would be, the reason they got a kicking in this is because you search for a product on Google search and the thing that it promoted at the top was Google shopping. There's no way for some other shopping provider to compete with that. No, there is, well, surely other people, no, I mean, if you do a Google search for something, other shopping providers can, will appear in the search results. Yeah, but they won't appear perf- at the top in, in a nice big separate box with pictures. Right. Well, that's, if you use Google, that's what you get, right? In the same way that if I use Google uh, Gmail, it quite nicely integrates with Google Calendar. It doesn't necessarily integrate as nicely with Outlook Calendar. That's what happens when you choose products. If I go out and buy... Um, a Nest thermostat, it's going to quite nicely integrate with the other services that they provide. If I go out and buy, um, you know, Cubase, it integrates really nice with other Cubase hardware. That's just life. That's why I find this antitrust stuff maddening. Is like, I, I absolutely agree that we should, we should not have a world where a, a tiny number of, of, of large corporations rule everything because it, it makes it difficult for the smaller organizations to compete. But this just strikes me as a penalty and success. If you're if you're Honda car tomorrow, you got a letter. Is it Honda? You uh, used to have a Honda. Uh, no. Oh no, no you've got Maserati. a Caddy Ma- now. Maserati. You've not no, got a Maserati. Maserati. <laughs> you've got a Cadillac. Um, no, sorry, the other one. No, that's the, yeah, the other one. Yeah, Bugatti. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So imagine you get a letter from Cadillac and it says, right from now on, it only runs on Cadillac gas. And you say, no, I want to be able to fill it up in the shop down the road. And they go, not our problem, right? You bought our car. We can do what we want with it. I would now agree. Now it only runs on our petrol, right? That'd this is terrible. exactly the same thing. No, it isn't. It, it isn't. Is. Because, you can, because you can look at other shopping results in, in, in a Google search. You, They're not stopping. If they, if they were basically stopping the ability for you to look at other shopping results, I would agree with you. If you could only use Gmail with Google Calendar, I would agree with you. But you can use these things with other things. You just have to, be, you have to work it a little bit harder. And it's a, a minuscule amount of effort to work a little bit harder. This is, this is I, I think this is ridiculous, in, in my personal view. It's a pretty nuanced topic. We could spend a whole segment on this, I think, because it sounds we like should. we have vastly, vastly <laughs> different it, it, opinions on this. It, 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 sounds, it sounds like we should, since John's opinion appears to be antitrust is not a crime. Don't worry about it. So <laughs> I, we, should, we, should spend, look, we should spend longer on this, but we should move on to something else. We should, we should, we should. Yes. Uh, all right, language, give us some news. Okay, so I've got a kind of a good news, bad news thing, right? Um, uh, bad news. You remember the UK, uh, the UK government have suggested they're going to ban encryption, and everyone yes. went, "But that's a stupid idea." Well, now it apparently is. the um, the Australian Attorney General is uh, is also pushing the same idea of essentially legislating uh, governmental backdoors into encryption, and is presenting that to the whole Five Eyes group. Now, the Five Eyes is the UK, the US, um, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Well, who all cooperate on uh, governmental surveillance and uh, encryption technology and communications technology and so on. And the the Australian Attorney General is presenting to the Five Eyes group the idea that this whole ban encryption legislate government backdoors, they should all do it. 
So it's not just UK insanity. It now pays me everybody insanity. Hooray! I mean, that's terrible enough, but the fact that the Five Eyes group is... is uh, Because there's Five Eyes, it's obviously run by Cyclops as well, is is pretty freaky. <laughs> the Five Eyes of that's Sauron is what they are. But my, but, but, but <laughs> that my, is terrible, though. My good news thing, which counteracts this, and I'll be interested in your views on which one we think is the direction of the world. The nice thing is that the, uh, you know, the DMCA prohibits you uh, avoiding uh, locks, software locks on things, even if you feel like you've got a legit reason. Mm -hmm. Um, They've now brought in a new exemption. Every couple of years, they review the exemptions to this, right? What everyone wants is there to be an exemption so you can go and tinker with things, and there never is. But they have now brought in one which says that it's okay to circumvent the locks in order to repair stuff. So, because an awful lot of, like, car manufacturers will say things like, um, you have to come back to our garage to get your car fixed or tuned, and you say, I want to do it myself, and they go, well, you can't, because that's circumventing an encryption technology, which is against the DMCA. That is now not allowed. So you are allowed to, well, that's not true, sorry, they can't, they can't now do you under the DMCA for circumventing the locks. There's no guarantee that you'll succeed in circumventing the locks, but if you do, if a third-party car a uh, repair place sets up and will repair your car. They can't be busted under the DMCA for circumventing. So that's a good thing, right? That's a re- that's a relaxation of formerly quite oppressive technological rules. What, yeah. I'm in- what I'm interested in is, do we think the world is more heading in the direction of we're going to lock you, uh, we- we're going to legislate governmental backdoors to encryption, or more heading in the world uh, in the direction of we're going to relax things like the DMCA? It seems like we're at an inflection point where it could go either way pretty rapidly. <laughs> Honestly. Yes, we uh, we are I, we are on the balance beam. Perhaps I know I'm I'm usually the optimist on this show, but I not in this case. I I, I think it's going to get worse. I think I think there's going to be more and more government pressure to be in your technology every day. Um, not necessarily. I mean, traditionally, the reasons for that I think have been uh, terrorism, but I think it's going to be cybercrime. You know, it's going to be all of this hacking that's going on. This is just going to be a rationale by um, governments, and I, particularly in invasive governments, and I'm not talking about you know Syria or Russia. I'm thinking about the U.S. in many ways um, to just you know to, to be able to mitigate these issues with some way of being able to perform you know real time forensics. So I, I can the, believe that. And the thing is, I think we'll we'll never know about it, and it's and it's tricky, I think, because um, to be fair. Um, you do need to allow a certain level of protection. Like, you know, there are some people of the view that the government shouldn't be in any of your business, and I disagree with that, but it's where the line is drawn. And of course, that is just fraught with challenges, and you, there's no way of defining that li- line effectively. So we don't want what Snowden unveiled, but there's got to be something that can help protect people. So I don't know. Yeah, but it's okay because big companies will come and save us whether we want them to or not, apparently. Jeremy, what's your piece of news? I told you, I don't think big companies, apart from bacon heavy industries, should be running the world. That was very smooth, very smooth. <laughs> that, it was also genuinely unkind, and I apologise for it. Jeremy. I'm very upset right now. So this was actually very difficult to choose which news item I was going to go with. There's actually a lot going on. There is the... Young people are actually paying for news more than I would have suspected. Article that came out yesterday that was really, really interesting. There was the Google Home is six times more likely to answer your question than Amazon Alexa, which obviously applies to the segment that we did last show. Hang on, on, bear with with me. Does that mean Google Home is six times more likely to give you a correct answer or Google Home is six times more likely to wake up accidentally when it shouldn't? (laughs) Could could be both. I'll I'll include these in the show notes because we're obviously not going to be able to talk about them all. And then there's another antitrust one. I think it's interesting that Walmart is not allowing you to, is not buying services from anyone that uses AWS because they don't want their information on their biggest competitor. But I think the new story that I'll have to cover is the ransomware that, as of this morning, is kind of ripping through everywhere from everything that I can tell. And it's still a little bit early, so I'm unfortunately obviously not going to be able to include a lot of details here. But it appears that everyone from Merck and Marsk to a bunch of Russian oil companies, Chernobyl was infected, a bunch of ATMs yeah. and places are down. So already, even in this first couple hours, because we're recording midday on Tuesday, it appears that this is going to be one of the worst ones probably to hit ever, If it can, certainly if it continues at this pace. So I don't yeah, know how much you guys have seen about that since it just happened, but... I saw the I saw, I saw the Chernobyl thing. They've um they've shut down automatic checking for whether it's going to cause radioactive death, and they've got people checking manually. Apparently, <laughs> that is that is true. 
<laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's not good. Because, because that's just what you need if you're some guy in Russia, you know, exactly. with, with, with an NBC suit and a dream, that a bunch <laughs> that, 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 that a bunch of hackers have now made it so you have to go into the hot zone with your glowing green suit and check that everything's all right. <laughs> Cheers, software people. We love you too. I'm Ta-da. sure the three residents left in Pripyat are very upset about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, if there's someone living in the village near Chernobyl and they haven't got the message yet, then hope is just all lost for them, I think, to be yes. honest. So it yeah. looks like this was based on the Petia, which is the uh, Windows, what was the yes. previous one, WannaCry. But it's a slightly different strain, so they very, very cleverly, I almost think Jono had something to do with this naming, called it Not Petia. So. <laughs> You're welcome. It was, it was all me. Uh, apart from if the authorities are listening, then it was nothing to do what, with me. <laughs> what, was it, what, what was interesting there is that you used the, the word strain there. And I saw a couple of reports with people saying, yeah, it seems to be a strain or a mutation of the previous one. And for the first bit, when I was reading about it, I kind of got the impression that it was a, someone hadn't crafted a new thing based on the old software. It like spontaneously mutated like actual viruses do. I thought, oh my God, this is the end of the world if they're going to start metastasizing. But <laughs> fortunately, that that's, not, bad. That that's be, not what happened. That'd be quite bad. But I almost think this That'll would be, be an interesting yeah. segment, you know, one of these days, malware and, and the impact that it's having, not only on business, but governments. I mean, if something were to happen here with Chernobyl, obviously that would be probably the biggest event yet for malware. But it, it's pretty clear that from a monetary and, and possibly physical harm perspective, malware is only going to get drastically more serious from here on forward. Well, I mean, b- people like Bruce Schneider have been warning about this for as long as I can remember. Yes. Um, unfortunately, we're now it's seeing it happen. You know, we've we, we, we reached the Hubbard warned us about peak oil in the 50s and now it's happening stage for that and software well. as ever moves faster. Schneier has been warning us about this forever, but that's like saying, well, Richard Stallman warned us about the risks of proprietary software, right? There is, there is a balance, right? You know, there is, uh, there is... I, I, hang on, hang on, hang on, right? Bruce Schneier is not um, right because a stopped clock is right twice a day. <laughs> no. He's he war- he warning, about us, he warning us about this legitimately, and it's happened. No. I know, I'm just being a smartass, Okay. <laughs> That's fair. No, it's fair. I've I've much respect for Schneier, to be fair. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, do we have any more news? Are we done? No. Nope, end of the news. Uh, what about personal news? Tell me, both of you. Tell me one thing that's happened in your life that's newsworthy that no one else is going to care about. I think it'll be interesting. Go on. That no one else is going to care about. Um, yeah. Well. Uh, someone, my, off, someone off. My daughter's in a performance, and I was at Foss Talk Live at the weekend. There you oh go. yeah, how'd How that go? It? Uh, it went really well, actually. It was a good laugh. Um, <laughs> also, don't care about your daughter's performance. <laughs> uh, apparently not. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure to pass that on. Um, no, yeah, no, no, I'm um, scared of her. Foster Live was a really good laugh, actually. A um, uh, well, whole, well. whole lot of people went. Um, I believe most of the shows who were there are putting out a kind of live show. Uh, the Linux Voice people were there later on. Linux were there. The Ubuntu podcast were there. And they, and they all recorded the show, basically. And those will all be out some point nice. over the next week or so. So that's cool. There was... Um, the, so everyone the, the, but the, Bad Voltage from the sound of it? Well, the late night mashup show um, was also recorded and will also be published. And it was really interesting. We, we, what we did was we took... Um, you will, you've seen from the last show, I said... Um, People send us questions. And we've got loads and loads and loads of questions. We've got into a load of um, really good discussions about them with the people on the show and the uh, and the audience. That was really good. Nice. And then there was many bears until like three o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> it, oh. it was good fun. Thank you very much, Joe Ressington, for, for organising it. I should say. It irritates me that you did this because I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> you, and therefore, you can't have fun unless <laughs> you could. You could have come over. I mean, he's yeah, only I'll half just, joking. I'll by just, the way. I'll just hop on the plane. <laughs> I'll remind you of that next I'll time. You say, "Why are you coming to Oscon?" Right? <laughs> but yes, no, it was, it, it was a really good laugh. Um, it's a kind of a nice, friendly sort of thing. It's not like Oscon, right? It's a little, it's a little friendly thing. Um, but that's that's really enjoyable at times. You know, it's, it's yeah, just get together, have have some beers, have a laugh. All right, all right, Jeremy. What's interesting in your world? Uh, well, I, I did not do any kind of phosphorus related stuff over the weekend, but I did do a ride for cancer t- for charity on Friday and then a run early Saturday where you cross the uh, finish line or the cross the 50 yard line for the finish line at the stadium where the Buffalo Bills play. So that was a good weekend in that regard. Nice. Yeah. What a good guy. Yeah. So you're actually like 
down there in the stadium, surrounded by the stands cheering. Yeah, so you do. It's a 5K, which is just over three miles. And like I said, the end of it, you run through the tunnel where they come out and across the, the finish, uh, finish line was right on the 50-yard line. Then they let you have beers and some food and stuff on the field after that. So it was, it was a pretty good time. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. That's actually really good. Does it say, I mean, uh, uh, Anfield, where Liverpool play, um, uh, above the tunnel it says, this is Anfield. And the people reach up and touch it as they're coming out of the tunnel. It's a very evocative moment, right? Is there anything like that as you're coming through the Bills Stadium? Yeah, we used to have a whole bunch of pithy terms, but they've been so bad for so long now that I think it's just there's like a tear or something when you come out of the tunnel. And <laughs> just well, running I'm, out well, and avoid avoiding the dog turds on the grass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the 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 evocative moment is everyone runs out onto the uh, everyone runs out in front of the stands and then bursts into tears. It just says lol <laughs> when you run out. <laughs> oh, that's tragic. Go on, yeah, Mr. Bacon. Tragic. What, what about you, to? Mr. Bacon? No, I really don't have much. I just uh, the, the only thing that I think is probably that I was actually thinking when I, I didn't intend this for me to actually share one of these things. So it was more interesting you guys. I figured you but had something thing... epic that you wanted to share, and that's why you no, were bringing this up not. in the first Honest... place. <laughs> no, honestly not. Um, but but thinking about it, um, the other day um, I was just working from my office, and then I noticed that the clouds like started parting. It was a very, very rainy day. The clouds parted, and I could hear angels singing. And just the gentle kind of flutter of wings. And then the doorbell rang and I went downstairs. And what did I see in my doorstep? A Mycroft. Mycroft, yeah. It finally shipped. So, yeah, I haven't tried it yet, but uh, we'll see what happens. I'm going to put really? a video online. So. You haven't tried it yeah. yet? No, I've just been busy. I haven't had a chance. Seriously, so my, clearly, gonna... coming up soon, a review of the Mycroft on Bed Voltage. Well, here, let me try it now. It's still in the box. <laughs> Mycroft! <laughs> <laughs> wow, my, my Echo Dot arrived no. and I didn't even put it down after getting it off the delivery bloke before I'd opened it and got it plugged in. <laughs> so. Right. Well, you don't have a proper job, do you? So that's fine. <laughs> so, sorry, I, I need to write some more think pieces, don't I? <laughs> yeah, you do. It's a proper job. All right. And that's Enough the news. news. So this is a, a story that I believe... Jano suggested it might even have been in a new store and we didn't end up covering it. I suspect, did, did and this is why I suspect this, <laughs> it's called the Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act. And if you will notice, that is ACDC, which is, is. Uh, why I'm sure it was <laughs> Mr. Bacon that suggested this. But what, I don't, I'm genuinely terrified. I don't remember suggesting this. But, this <laughs> but what this is, is uh, Tom Graves, who's a Georgia Republican uh, put this, it's, it hasn't been passed to my knowledge yet, but it's a bill which would allow victims to quote unquote hack back. And it's changed a couple times based on feedback. But basically, if your smart TV, iPhone, or laptop has been hacked, this legislation would allow you to legally hack back to access the attacker's computer and identify them. And what he said, this is a quote from him this bill is empowering individuals to defend themselves online just as they have the legal authority to do during a physical assault. And as I said, they, they went back and forth about how this would work. And this bill would allow you to uh, attack, quote, persistent unauthorized intrusion to, to any of your computers to gather information in order to establish attribution of criminal activity to share with law enforcement or to disrupt continued unauthorized activity against the victim's own network. What it would not allow you to do is destroy any information, cause physical injury, or create a threat to public health or safety, which seems like interesting wording. And so I'm curious what you guys think about this. What, In theory, what it sounds like he would like you to be able to do is have a random person be able to figure out who was the perpetrator of this cybercrime and, and find out who they were, which I am... Let's see. I, I think that's a dubious thing to expect out of the average person. <laughs> uh, but he does say that if they broke laws in the, the last addition or last addendum, rather, that he made was, in theory, if they hacked back and they made a bad decision and they were not well equipped and they did not have the experience that was required, they would fall under the full force of the law in place today. And that's a strong law. So it's basically a hack back unless you then do something illegal, in which case full force of the law on you. So thoughts. And and, presu and presumably yeah. the hackers can hack back. I mean, to be honest with you, and when I heard about this, I was thunderstruck. But such I'm a recursive loop of hackers. <laughs> <laughs> I, be I believe, however, it's leaving us on a highway to hell. This law, right, so exactly. 
<laughs> and the show is now named Infinite Loop of Hackback. <laughs> I mean, it, it 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 is weird because I, I on one on one hand I can understand you know if someone was to hack me that I would probably want to you know shoot them down in flames, um, but the the problem that we've got here I think is what happens if the person gets you know what happens if they get it wrong you know like full force what of law. happens yeah I mean, well it's just it's it is the uh, you somebody up is like dubious Jeremy I think it is really dubious because on one hand. I, I can see it's it's the same argument that kind of gun fans have, right? Yes. That the reason to own a firearm is to protect yourself in the in the event of an incident. But on the other hand, you know, where do you draw the line? And I just, I don't know, it doesn't feel... I see it, like, I, I see the intellectual argument for this, but I it feels weird to me. Well, thing. put it this way, right? Um, we've, we've had discussions about um, gun control and so on on the show in the past. We've made our views reasonably clear. And there is, I think, an... There's a direct analogy between this and if someone breaks into your house holding a gun, are you allowed to shoot them, right? Should we leave that specific point to one side and and say, yes, that's there? Probably the view you take on the gun thing will be the view you take on the morality of this. I think there are a bunch of additional issues mm-hmm. which apply to this and don't apply to that. Oh, you, you, you feel you don't see them as analogous, Jeremy. That's interesting, then. I think physical harm is a little bit different. I think someone coming into your home is a slightly different line, in my opinion. If, uh, would you rather I irretrievably deleted your home directory or punched you in the face? Uh, punch- <laughs> <laughs> That's a because I, I, because you would probably break a finger punching me in the face. I'm going to go punching me in the face. But I, I, what I mean is, if someone came in, I, I think if you would, ask John if he would rather have someone come into his living room where Jack is with a weapon or delete his home directory, as much as him losing his home directory would be a royal pain in the ass, he does not want someone breaking into his home with a gun with his son there. That's yeah, a different no, I- line. And 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 that's fair play. Okay, so um, hopefully his but, home directory is backed up. I assume he has not figured out how to back up Jack yet. That's what se- that's that. what that's what second right. kids are for, right? <laughs> <laughs> second kid redundancy. <laughs> Everyone out there who's a younger brother or sister is thinking, "Great, I'm a backup child." Fabulous. <laughs> Not what, not, not what I meant, youngest. Basically, child. just a different availability zone is all you are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, you have sex duplicates. You're like, no, we're just ensuring five nines of reliability. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I, I think there is, there is, there is definitely, a, there is definitely a. I think I agree with Jeremy. There's, there's a, there's a different line there, and I think most people probably would agree that, like, you know, if if there is, if if there is direct physical harm that's coming your way then there is a, a very strong argument for being, being able to protect yourself. There is also just like, you know, much as uh, I don't want to, you know, undersell the the skill that's required to use a firearm properly, but I would argue that, um, you know, guns are easier to use than being able to successfully hack someone within the parameters of the ACDC act, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I think part of this is I'm guessing that Graves is not a huge computer guy. I don't know Tom Graves personally, but I'm going to just go out on a limb here based on this bill. I think he probably saw an episode of NCIS or, or something where two people are smashing on a keyboard at the same time and all of a sudden, you know, trace route works and it goes back to the guy's <laughs> IP address at his house in his living room and they can go through the wire and look at him or something. Yeah. So I, I think given that as the baseline, this probably sounds like a good idea. The reality of how cybercrime works is so far removed from that, that in reality, I, I do not think one-tenth of one percent of the population has the skill to to track down someone effectively, let yeah. alone the average person. I agree. There, there are... Um... One of, the th- one of the things about breaking into your home is there's kind of a bright line test for it, right? That you have a demarcation line around your property. If someone is on that, there is a crime of trespass. There is, in theory, a crime of uh, criminal trespass. It's not exactly the same, but there's a kind of idea there. But it's a lot more kind of hand wavy and ill defined in law what it would mean to trespass on someone's virtual estate, right? It, as Jeremy said, it, um, one of the things he talks about is persistent. You know, it has to be a persistent attempt to attack. But how many times do you have to be um, attacked for it to be persistent? The other thing about this is pretty much by definition, if someone breaks into your house, they're under the same laws that you are. Right. Right. But that 
does not apply on the internet. No, when, um, the, the, when the other person and the person on the other end of that hack is in North Korea, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, but I think if the person on the other end of that hack is in France, historically, the US has taken an extremely dim view of other countries going, our laws apply and yours don't, Yanks, when you're outside the country. And it seems a bit off to then go, we're going to de- we're gonna give ourselves the right to do this and hack you back if you're somewhere else, when there's no way people would sit still for it if, I don't know, Germany passed a law saying this was legit to do and targeted US people. Right, that's true. You know, I mean, it leads into things like extraordinary rendition. So I don't know if you can do extraordinary rendition in cyberspace. It doesn't really work. Well, but <laughs> I'd also like to know what the goal of this act is. Like, if you, so if someone hacks me, shall yeah, I tell I you have... what the goal of this act is? It is to look tough on cybercrime. Is what the goal of this act is? Right. Well, I he mean, said current but... law essentially leaves individuals and businesses defenseless if their antivirus software fails. I want that to change. Right. And, it's, appe- but, it's appealing to the sort of people who think it ought to be okay to carry a gun in Walmart. Well, he said this, but, the, the specific view was, I would like to gather information, I would like people to be able to gather information in order to establish attribution of criminal activity to share with law enforcement or to disrupt continued unauthorized activity. So they want people to, instead of law enforcement having to do this, they would do it and just say, here, law enforcement, this happened. The thing that's funny is the very latest version in order to, quote-unquote, curtail unintended consequences, would require the company or individual to notify the FBI's National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force in advance about their plans to responsively hack. Yeah, because that's going to work. Sure, I'm sure right? that's what the FBI wants, is this every is time someone stupid. in their living room is going to do this to contact them. Come on. Also, you know, also uh, God's uh, honest truth, if you ring the Phoebes and go, oh, I'm going to do this, are they going to go, okay, we've made a note of it in our little book, or are yes. they going to go, no, don't do that? So uh, wouldn't a better version of this... Uh, so <clears throat> if we all presume... I'm not saying we all agree on this, because uh, I certainly don't know what I think on this, but if we assume, for the sake of argument, that a citizen should have the right to fight back, to hack back, right? Wouldn't a more appropriate like I, the thing that bothers me about this thing is <clears throat> is I, I just i've spent a bit of time working with security companies and i just know and i know you guys know as well how phenomenally involved and delicate and how much nuance is involved in in hacking right yep. it's not like to your point jeremy it's not like it's not like ncis so wouldn't a better version of this act be to essentially define a set of criteria and some kind of certification that individuals can achieve that will allow them to do this and then what you get is like an industry of of individuals freelancers or businesses where somebody who's been hacked they can go through them to do the hack back as opposed to the individual Right. No, so an individual could well, do well, that. well, okay, we do have um a group of people who are authorized to do this and should be trained to do it. They're called the police. Right? Yes. Vigilante yeah. justice is not okay just because it's done over SSH. No, what I'm saying <laughs> is presuming, as I said, presuming that... that, that so that you want, like, the, the digital Pinkertons okay. or something. So presuming... I don't know what that is. That sounds like a kid's TV show. Um, so <laughs> what is the digital Pinkert... What is the Pinkertons? The Pinkertons were, like, a pre-police force, but they were privatized. Yeah, oh. the Pinkertons detective agency, they, but at, right? But the, at, the point at one is point, they, around, they were bigger than the standing army. Yeah, but they were the when there weren't police. They're, they're a Wild West thing. It's not like them. It's like, who were the, the vigilante group in New York in the 80s? Can't think of the name now. Um, but yeah, it's Fair that enough. kind of thing. Vigilante stuff is not okay. But, that, but, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I'm saying if somebody, if we assume the premise that it's okay to hack back, right? I would say if, if you're going to do that, it's better to do that in some kind of regulated in some kind of like structured way as a as opposed to just letting anyone how about it you know so i don't know I, that to me would be a better way than just you know joe blogs who goes to walmart and to, then to goes me... and down goes and downloads some kind of because what happens people are going to download some shit off the internet they're going to type in how do i hack bob yes and they're going to download some horrible piece of software that's going to fill their computer that's going to turn their computer into a botnet and provide the illusion that they're hacking bob and they're going down like a 3d tunnel oh i can already see the buzzfeed article top five ways to hack back I, and, oh. and you will get absolutely that software which has got like now hacking Bob with like a five character password with the letters filling individually. And meanwhile, it's inhaling your entire hard drive and mailing it to actual hackers. Lol. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> what was the thing? What was the thing back in the nineties when uh, you could 
reset people's machines over IRC. Do you remember that? Like when people were in, there was, there was, I forget what it was called, but I, I downloaded this and used it when I was like 18. But you could basically press a button and then suddenly like the entire channel just empties out. It's like some exploit. No, oh, don't remember Nuking. that. Nuking. Wind nuke. Wind nuking. Oh, that's right. What it yeah, was. yeah. Like the ping of death and all that? that kind of thing. I do remember that. that yes. That's what's going to happen. You're basically going to get that kind of stuff. It's like yeah. script kiddie heaven. It's a disastrous yes. idea. Uh, th- this is this is part of the problem. And, and to your point, John, I mean, ignoring the fact that I think that your group of uh, trained individuals ought to be the police and not some third right. party. Ignore that. Even if we go for the third party thing, I don't think that the people pushing this bill will go for it because they don't want that. They want to give Joe Random the ability to fight back. Not it, If you're the sort of person who, who thinks it's reasonable to carry a gun and fight back on that basis, then you don't want to say, no, why don't you go to this enforcement organisation instead? It's supposed to be bringing the power out to the people, right? This is like the digital to- version of Stand Your Ground, I guess. Yes, absolutely. Right. But to be, and much as I personally, I don't, I don't like this act, and I agree with you, I think vigilante justice is not a good thing. Um, <clears throat> the police aren't equipped to do this, obviously. Right. So even if the police were equipped to do this, even if the police were allowed, allowed and able to do this, right? Like you can't go to a police officer and say, please go and hack Bob because he stole my, you know, my whatever from my computer electronically. They're A, not going to be able to do that legally. And B, they're probably not going to have the skills to do that. So there, there is a gap in the market for something like this, arguably. But I, much as well, I, I think, think for the wrong, wide spread malware varieties the nsa and fbi certainly are going to be looking into this for the you got breached by a jilted x or something i yeah i guess there's a space on the market for that yeah and that's the other thing is like where do you draw the line for hacking right like if someone posts something you don't like (coughs) on facebook some people will perceive that as a hack like if someone yes if i take a picture and someone and someone you know nabs the picture from my phone and you know because you know they're sat in front of it and i'm going to the loo or something like that they will accuse that, that that they will claim that to be a hack. Well, to give you to give you an example, how many times have we seen some politician or something attempt to take a picture of their own dick and then text it to a mistress and instead accidentally post it on Twitter and then say, <laughs> "Oh no, oh no, my account was hacked." Right. right. <laughs> I think it's the survival of the fittest, but it's like the it's like the Tron version of survival of the fittest. Well, this well, is no longer he- about running away from a lion. <laughs> this is, if you if you're the kind of person who accidentally posts a dick pic to Twitter. <laughs> This life ain't for you. <laughs> well, here is the thing. Right? From, a, from a bigger picture point of view, um, we talked in the new segment about... about, about Not that people big like, of a people like, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not what I meant. Um, <laughs> high resolution, though. Um, so, <laughs> um, people like... Uh, we, we talked in the new segment about how people like Bruce Schneier have been warning us about cyber war for 10 or 15 or 20 years. The idea that someone's going to say a thing saying, okay, cyber war, basically inevitable, better start arming up for it, worries me a bit. You know, we don't <laughs> want to accelerate this kind of thing. We want to stop it happening. Well, and to your point earlier about, you know, kind of gun fans or Second Amendment fans uh, likely to support this viewpoint that you should be able to defend yourself. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence about this because, and I don't want to turn this into a debate about gun, about gun law and gun control or whatever else. I'm uncomfortable with guns. I'm, I I've always have been uncomfortable around guns. I don't like guns. But I also see the argument that gun advocates have it from a defensive perspective. And I can kind of see it in this, in this case as well. I don't like the idea of, um, of people hacking back for all of the reasons that we've identified. But there is something to be said about being able to defend yourself legally. Um, that's why to me having some kind of some some way of proving your ability to do that as opposed to allowing everybody to do that is the only way in my mind that you could do this effectively you know i don't know i i understand what you're saying it just to my mind it's it's extrajudicial um and regardless of whether you, te- you go technically, it isn't extrajudicial because we've passed a law, right? right it's just your, law, it's- your, your law isn't allowed to apply to people in Moscow. That's not how laws work. Right? All right, right. Ar- arbitrarily designating people in other countries as being targets is is a kind of might makes right approach. And fine, you know, that's international politics, right? You're allowed to do that if you've got the missiles. But what you're not supposed to do is give the missiles to the people on the street and go, if you feel aggrieved, 
fire one off. There's also like a, from a wider sociological perspective, one thing that's bugging me about the world right now is we have too much of a tit for tat culture, right? Yes. Like where someone says something and then somebody responds and then somebody responds to that, somebody responds to that. The amount of bickering in the world right now is just, it's untenable, right? And it, 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 I worry that it would be basically, yeah, the cyber warfare version of tit for tat. Like at least you take something such as you take, you know, these platforms like Hacker One or Bug Crowd or whatever else, you know, Synac, um, and what they're doing is they're, 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 they're providing that very structured funnel in which people can perform hacking in a way that has, you know, optimal outcomes, right? That's how these platforms work. There's no premise of that in this act whatsoever. It's just, yeah, you can go do whatever you want, so long as you're not impacting public health and whatever else. So, yeah. All right. I feel like we've taught this one to death. Although one thing was bothering me. And it was what was the vigilante New York City uh, 1980s group? It was oh, driving yeah. me bananas. I think it was the Guardian Angels. Thank you. That's exactly because it, it was. They were. Yes, it was driving me bonkers. <laughs> ah. And and, yeah. and again, I mean, there, there were a whole bunch of arguments back then about oh, they may still be around. I'm not sure. Um, but there was a whole bunch of arguments back then about is what they're doing legit? And there were people on both sides of that argument, and they both had legitimate points. And this is a similar kind of a thing. But what John is describing is some kind of cyber guardian, cyber guardian angels. What is not what didn't happen even back then was that anyone who they like could just put on a guardian angels t-shirt and punch people in the pub. Right, right. And there's just also the. It, it, this is the same argument that people have towards drone strikes, right? When you remove the human from the situation, it changes the psychology of how people make decisions, right? To the point we made earlier on about if someone's running at you with a knife, like that's a very different mental model than if you sat in your basement at home full of vitriol because someone st stole a picture of your cat from Facebook, uh, you know, from your phone and put it on Facebook and said it's an ugly cat, um, you know. Interesting topic. Well, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you for the Akadaka Act. And, uh, you know, if for no other reason than it gave us something to talk about. <laughs> what do you think, people? Let us know in the forum. You know where it is. Now, a, a person we've met and uh, all of us met, all of us respect, is Benjamin Mako Hill. And he recently did a write-up about how he's been working with Wikipedia, and they invented a, a new kind of a thing. It's essentially a gamified tutorial for new Wikipedia contributors. They identified a few people who passed, uh, identified a bunch of people actually, who passed some basic tests about how, about their making uh, meaningful contributions to Wikipedia. And their goal here is to improve the number of contributors improve the the depth of contributions that that come into Wikipedia because it's been tailing down. It's been trending down basically since about two thousand and seven. So they put together this gamified tutorial, right? And it kind of led you through the process of contributing and different things you can do and so on. And you got um, points and a measure of how you did and so on. And then they they talked to people afterwards about whether they enjoyed it and so on and so forth. They they actually they identified about. A thousand people who passed their right. basic red line for they seem to want to become uh, decent contributors and sent them details of this tutorial. About 350, 400 of them actually took it in the end, 380 something, I think. Um, and basically everyone who took it liked it. Everyone thought it was great. Loads of people took it and it's had no effect whatsoever on their contributor rate, right? They built right. this thing, did a lot of good work. Um, everyone thinks it's great. It just isn't fixing it at all. So my conclusion on this basis is that everything John O's ever said about community contribution is rubbish and community management is all useless. What do you think? <laughs> wow. <laughs> You first, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a pretty I'm going to need some room. <laughs> I was going to say that was a pretty pointed and directed thing towards you, so I was going to let you have the floor, sir. Well, <laughs> I, I, be, be, being slightly more serious here, it is fascinating that by most measures, pe people, who, people who did this liked it. It looks like a good idea up front, but right. when, when the rubber hits the road, actually when faced with the data, it's not actually affected the metric they're trying to affect with it. So it's, I think is, interesting here, it, it, and this is something that I've certainly been thinking a, a lot about lately, is is metrics and what they mean. And, and what really struck me here was that if they would have just took as what the important metric is, as how people felt about it, 
and stopped there, they would have thought they did a really good job with this gamification. Yeah. But it turns out the metric that you really care about wasn't really impacted at all. So I, I think one thing that comes out of this is as you measure communities, you really what you measure is very, very important and something you need to keep in mind. I, yeah. I, th- I think pretty much everyone um, has realized that you've got to have a real metric that you can measure. You can't just ask people what they think because yes. people either misreport it or... In this case, everyone's really, really happy. It gets very, very positive feedback in the evaluation. It just didn't change the newcomer contribution behavior, right? It, it, it did not um, increase the amount they participated, either on Wikipedia or on talk pages in the, you know, the, in the community side of Wikipedia. It didn't, it also didn't have any effect on the quality of the edits they were making. The, the amount of edits, edits they were making didn't drop off, but it didn't increase either. But you could make a case that, okay, maybe they're not doing more work, but they're doing better work. But that didn't seem to be the case either. And exactly right. as Jeremy says, if you'd have got away from this saying, what did you think about that? And people went, yeah, it was really brilliant. You'd think, ha, we did a fantastic job. And maybe what you want to maximise for is contributor happiness rather than contributor efficiency. But... yeah. I'm not necessarily. They certainly didn't go into it attempting to maximise contributor happiness. So their 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 desired goal wasn't achieved. They may have achieved a different one. And I think the next yeah, question I mean, that raises is why, right? Well, I think that's what's why I thought I'd this. ask. A, I thought I'd ask a community manager why, because I don't know. <laughs> I, w- I would say because the entrenched Wikipedia <clears throat> editors have a reputation now for being somewhat capricious and, and somewhat arbitrary right and that probably dissents new people from wanting to contribute regardless of how their initial experience in the gamified system went their experience right. in actual wikipedia was still the same right i th- this is going to be kind of where my mind is going and to be to be completely frank with you i've only scanned over the work that mako did here and uh, i just want to take a moment to reiterate what we kind of briefly touched on but mako is at least for me, he's one of, like he's one of the people I respect the most in this kind of work. He's phenomenal, and he put a huge amount of the underlying governance and and various pieces in place in Ubuntu before I joined. Right, he's a really cool guy, and he does really really great work. For those unaware, the, just to add on to what you're saying, he is one of the original Ubuntu contributors. Correct, he was yeah. one of the, the yeah, core he, original. Yeah. He was he was on the original team at yeah. at, uh, at Canonical. He's very very active in Debian. Very very active in. Um, well, at least he was in the Free Software Foundation as well. So he's just a genuinely cool dude. Super smart. The, the thing that struck me about this was I'm not massively surprised by these results because, uh, I, I, first of all, Wikipedia is a massively entrenched community. There's all kinds of drama that's been attached to Wikipedia for lots of different reasons. So I think what this is, is this is, my without boring everybody, my view is that community is, you know, is is a, is a journey and you start out by defining a set of audiences you on-ramp them to make the first contribution and then they effectively go into th- three broad buckets as as people grow right you start out as new when you have no relationships no context and you mentoring and validation stuff like that really helps then you become a regular where you're typically having the same kind of workflow over and over again but applied to different problems and then you become like a leader. And that's where you typically are more interested in the wider health and success of the community. And the way in which we engage with those three different buckets of people, I think, varies in, in very, very different ways. What they did here was essentially dealing with that on-ramp piece. Um, and, and the on-ramp will work out well. Like if you, if you architect it well, it doesn't surprise me that the success of the on-ramp was good. But then what the problem is, is that then when you get connected into the wider community, that's where it seemed to fall over and that's because there's a whole set of other different bits and pieces that are that, that are causing problems there. Uh, I'm not experienced enough in Wikipedia to be able to point out what those things are. But in my mind, the way in which you really identify those issues is to look at the outside of that initial adventure, the Wikipedia adventure, is to identify the experience of those individual contributions like in a normal day-to-day world and be able to ad- identify the problems there, and then try to rectify those in, in you know, with small experiments. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, um, Mako himself, uh, in the, the blog post we released it, he says, um, maybe a tutorial isn't sufficient to counter hostile behaviour, which is exactly what Jeremy was saying, that um, yeah. y- y- um, the, the friendly, welcoming tone of the Wikipedia adventure might contrast with strongly worded messages that new editors receive from veteran editors or bots, which is kind of saying, yeah, we built a really friendly tutorial and then people walked out of the really friendly tutorial into the real Wikipedia world and got beaten down into a pulp and left. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and the thing is as well is like there's been, you know, one of, the, one of my 
something I've seen just in the work that I've been doing is that gamification, for example, of which this is it, this is game. Everybody thinks of gamification being badges, but obviously it's it, it's actual game mechanics as well. And this is more of a game than necessarily just badges. Uh, but gamification generally works very well for people who are new to something. Um, but then they get bored of the game and move on. And that's the real test around retention, right? The exception here is video games, because the gamification yes. experience when you get badges and trophies, the, the video game is the full experience, right? But, the, you know, if you're 75% through a video game, you're still exploring new things, t- you, know, in, you know, in storytelling video games as opposed to... And even then, like in, in multiplayer games, you're getting like... Like in Battlefield, you know, you get you get the more points you get, you get access to new weapons and things like that. In a community, you don't necessarily have that. So once you get to that onboarded piece, and then you go into the general community commons, um, it's not like people are saying, "Oh, well, when you accomplish this, you get this thing, or we incentivize you in these different ways." That, in my mind, is what you should be doing. That's what I recommend to my clients: is you want to constantly incentivize people with both, you know, intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. So they keep growing. So they keep going from that new to regular to, 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 to leader. So this, to me, is picking off a small piece of the puzzle. And it doesn't surprise me that it worked quite well in that piece, but it's very, very isolated. I'm, yeah. I, I've changed my tune quite a lot on gamification, actually. I mean, and, and this isn't about... Um, the Wikipedia adventure is uh, not a particularly big example of gamification. It's not all about badges and points and everything. Right, But the, right. But the idea, when people first started talking about this, you remember, Jono, um, we designed Ubuntu Accomplishments? Indeed, yeah. And, and explicit deli- and ex- it was fun. Explicit deliberate attempt to gamify Ubuntu particip- participation and, con- and contribution, right? Yeah. Um, and at the time, when, when gamification first started becoming a thing that people talked about, I think I and a lot of people went, wow, great, this is a way of getting metrics for this stuff rather than some hand-wavy feeling about how you're doing. We can put numbers on it. But in the intervening 10 years, maybe, I now think... This is a way of attempting to wedge numbers into a thing which is almost always not actually computable as a metric. It's like trying to come up with a number for how much you love somebody, right? Right. Um, An awful lot of the stuff that you actually need to improve and make better to make a community, to make a culture work, to make it be good, to make it not be oppressive and so on, is not something where you can just put a number on it and then go, look, we are two better than we were two months ago. Well, and and the the problem with that as well, I would say, is that... um I just did talk about this a few weeks ago, Matt Ravel's DevRelCon thing in um, San Francisco, is that a good example of this, I think, is events, right? When people go to a meetup, and what often happens is someone will give you a survey, and you have to go the day after, and you go and fill in the survey. And they think that that's good feedback for the event. It's bullshit. Because what happens is the psychology that you have the morning after when you're getting ready for work and you're having your coffee and all the rest of it is completely different to how you were thinking at the end of the event. Right. There's, there's something about being in the moment. So to me, the way to actually assess the quality of an experience is instead of asking people is that you observe lots of independently uninteresting things, but the correlation of those things tells you how well it went. So for example, with a meetup to determine like what content was most interesting to people, don't ask them, you'll get skewed results. Look at how many people sat, how many people were, were sat in each session How many people were sat near the front? How many people were on their phones or laptops? Um, And you can see browser windows that aren't taking notes. You know, how many hands went up when they asked questions? How many people were looking at the presenter? All these individual pieces, when you put them together, give you a better indication, I think, as opposed to trying to, like, to your point, wedging numbers in, in a place where the, you can't really get, that's the intangible value of community. It's very difficult to count that. Actually, amount of data used and velocity of amount of data used during a talk session would be really inf- interesting information to have. Yeah. Wouldn't it? And that, that seems like something that you could measure. So, so this kind of, um, John, what you're describing is basically measuring side channel metrics. You know, yes. don't, don't, don't attempt to, um, you, you're attempting to measure things which are influenced by the things you actually want to maximize. So you want to maximize happiness rather than participation. If what you want to do is maximize participation, then great, calculate the metric for it. If what you want to do is say, okay, we want there to be more people contributing to our open source project, then measuring the number of people who contributed last week and the number of people who contributed this week and checking that the graph goes up is a great idea. If what you want to do is how much better are we making the world, then it's hard to put a number on that. So So you look at things which which are measurable by numbers and are affected by that and then measure them instead. This is kind of Goodhart's law thing from economics, right? Or it's the opposite, yeah. of, it's the opposite of Goodhart's law, actually. Well, 
Because I think the challenge we have is that usually when, you know, the tangible measurements, things that we can measure with computers, yes, we can use that. So, you know, looking at, for example, looking at um, software engineering, you can, ma- you can measure pull requests and issues and whatever else. And that's broadly what we did in Ubuntu accomplishments. But the intangible stuff is the shit that we care about. It's happiness and satisfaction. Uh, and, I, I, and I, think, I, think, I think you care about both. There, there is actually, I, I no. don't want to give the impression that it's all impossible to measure intangible stuff. Sometimes no, no, no. you really do want to maximise the amount of code you're yeah. getting out into the world, not just making sure I'm putting out really brilliant, but not very much. But I would, I would say that two things. One is if we break it into the tangible and the intangible, right, value that you want to, that you want to measure, the tangible, the problem that I think that a lot of people have, and this was the criticism that people were freaked out about with Ubuntu accomplishments when we started doing that. People were worried that we'd be measuring, you know, like, did 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 someone file 500 bug reports and you know and then they get a, a badge because because yeah. people can game those systems so to me the sure. what you've got to measure is the activity and then the validation of that activity right was that a good quality thing that 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 was measured not just the thing that you measured but also on the intangible side of things because it's complicated i think most people basically resort to asking people surveys Yes. And if there's one thing i'm i'm learning more and more about as i get older and this is going to sound incredibly egotistical is people are generally, as a general rule, people don't know what they want. No. Right? So, like, so, self-reported evidence is useless. It's, it's not... Fucking it, useless. It, it, yeah. it's, it, it's, not, it's not, you know, helpful or the right idea, but no, it's useless. Don't do it at all. Don't ask people what they want. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's, like, it's like when you work with anyone who's like a, a, an exec in a company... What they say what they want and what they actually want are often two quite different things. Yeah, your, right? da- your damn job is to work out what it is they want and provide it to them, not to ask them. And the, the, right. the hard part of your job ought to be distilling what they tell you into the truth, not expecting them to give you the truth and then just performing it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, 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 think, I, mean, I think Jeremy, stuff is interesting. Jeremy, you're a good example here. If you look at something like LQ, you're um, obviously measuring uh, uh, or thinking about a bunch of metrics and so on about about participation and 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 happiness and so on and so forth. How do you go about this kind of thing? So, getting some higher quality metrics out of LQ is actually something that I've also been thinking about lately, and something that I've probably not been good enough about in general. But I think. I think I'll have a good answer for you soon as I think about it more, <laughs> which is probably not the answer you were looking for. But I mean, there's a, there's a lot of nuance to it. And like you said, you, what you don't want is a bunch of vanity metrics. And I think I've had a dimmer view on gamification than I think the two of you have for a very long time. And I think for a lot of reasons, and I've tried to work some gamification into LQ in various ways over the years, and it has predominantly gone very poorly. And I think... <laughs> what a lot of people maybe don't understand about gamification or maybe don't take into account is that u- using your example, John will write of, of 500 bug reports. Some people who give very high quality bug reports will look at that and think, well, that's not fair. I only gave 50, but they were really high impact bugs and they took me a ton of work. And now someone else did 500 and they get this badge and I don't. And it's a, a huge disincentive for some people or some people look at that, that number of 500 and say, that's so many, that's unattainable. I'm not going to do any. And it serves as a disincentive in that way. So I think you have to be yeah. careful not only what you're incentivizing, but what you're disincentivizing. And that's something that I, I think wasn't really taken into control in a lot of these models. There, there, there's also um, a thing to be taken into consideration. We're talking here about trying to measure intangibles by finding things that they influence and measuring them instead. But you obviously need to measure a whole bunch of stuff there rather than just the one metric you care about, which means okay. that capturing enough data to do this is inherently more invasive and therefore more worrying. Well, yeah, and, you know, I, I don't know, the... the the thing I think is the thing I think is interesting about this is that often one of the one of the challenges with capturing, you know, measuring the right things, I think, is that people m- measure a very one dimensional thing, right? They measure, you know, someone has. You, so to, to 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 gamify, you have to have some computer orientated way of measuring contribution, and that's a that's a path fraught with difficulties. One actually approach to this that I I um, I discovered when I was working with Hacker One which I was really impressed with is they actually measure three numbers, right? So hacker one, for those of you unfamiliar with it, it's a service where people can submit bug report, uh, submit vulnerabilities 
in popular products and services. And if it's valid, a report gets points. And if it's invalid, it gets negative points, right? And people get paid um, for valid bug reports in most cases. They have um, reputation, which is the overall kind of like, this is your total number of points. Um, uh, so a high reputation score is a good indication of longevity of contribution, right? If you've got 100,000 points, then you've obviously been doing it for a while. But they also measure signal, which is the average number of points that you get for an individual report. And that's really handy because that shows you quality. So there will be some people with a lot of reputation points who are just shotgunning reports left, right, and center, most of which get very few, um, very few points because they're kind of not very good reports. Um, so they've got a very high reputation score, but they've actually got a very low quality signal. And, and then that plays impact. into... That pl Oh, that, yeah, and then, briefly, and, that, play, and then, that plays to Jeremy's point about someone shows up and goes, but you've got 100,000 points. How am I ever going to catch up? But you should be maximizing your signal, not your total reputation. Right, exactly. So what that gives is it gives you a couple of different dimensions. So you optimize for signal as a baseline, so you get high quality, but then you optimize for for reputation because that then you then being, build the longevity. And to me, that's the, that's the right way of What's doing the third things. number they the, track? The third one is impact, which is effectively which is effectively how impactful your bug report is like if you know if you get like a high bounty um then it's a higher impact hmm. you you know it's, it's the number so of so so, so if you report heart bleed you get loads right. and loads and loads and loads of impact right. points you know and one of the, i i really like that breakdown i, I think the Im, the impact one is less interesting to me but the signal and the reputation longevity and 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 quality effectively i think is a really nice way of measuring that um because then then you get like a, a more accurate view of the contributor. The thing that they don't have in HackerOne today, which I think they should do, and I've said this to them, is there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no reputation decay. So if you stop doing work for a certain period of time, your points should go down because if they don't, people will never be able to catch you up. Aha, mm. now there is, um, there's actually a good derivable formula for this. Uh, there's a chap called Evan Williams um who he does a bit of software for the back called wizard which is a statistics manipulation thing but he's also written a bunch of really interesting blog posts about statistical stuff um things like uh how you should manage a um taking averages from a star system right everyone rates it five stars or four or three or whatever how do you take how do you calculate an average star rating um and it's not just add them all up and divide by the number right but the the right. thing he did was he sat down and derived kind of a theoretical really good way to to manage that kind of reputation decay and then said and if we derive the the formula that reddit used to work out whether a thing should be on the front page or not the reddit calculate the top points formula to know what's on the front page of reddit it's actually the same formula Hmm. Right. So, oh, the, so, so the point is that the Reddit people didn't just pull some numbers out of their arse or go, yeah, I'll tell you what, right? We'll just make it lose nine points every hour. That looks about right. And okay. they haven't just fiddled it randomly over time until it seems about right. There's actually a strong theoretical derivation for it. And so, so you have to read his stuff. Um, remind me, and I'll link to it in the show notes because the blog posts are really interesting. <laughs> I mean, a that lot of the math, a lot of the math, to be honest with you, is a bit beyond me. I was never a statistics person. So when he starts going on about eigenvectors, I just kind of nod and move on to the next paragraph. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think I think the Reddit people, they they don't think they get. I've said this before. I don't think they get enough credit for what they've built. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so interesting stuff. I would, you know, I would definitely love to hear people's thoughts on this on the forum. I mean, obviously, I'm a nerd in this area, and I know Jeremy's a nerd in this area as well. Yes, um, and maybe, maybe particularly within the context of LQ, it'd be interesting to hear what people think about about um, you know deriving kind of data from sites like that. But go to <laughs> community.badvolts.org. Uh, uh, honestly, I'm not sure you're going to get that many people. Invested in LQ, going oh well, let's go and comment on someone else's forum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, but whatever. Uh, do it. You know, our forum's way nicer. You can, yeah, you know, obviously, you, you know, it's just because we're there. Uh, yeah, stop, you, stop you trying to get, split the. You only get Jeremy in, in LQ, but you get you get the other. Stop two. trying to split the party, dude. We're not doing this. <laughs> So we did a competition. We did uh, in the in, did. In, in the last show. Uh, we talked about assistants, Google Home, Alexa, 
Hang on. Okay, we talked about OK Google. We talked about Alexa. We talked about Cortana. We talked about Siri. <laughs> hey Siri. Minecraft. Uh, what's the What's the wake word for Minecraft? We should say it just out loud, just to make sure we wake up everyone's Minecraft. Um, I thought it was pulpy. <laughs> so I think you have to pre- I think you have to pre- I think you have to press a button. <laughs> so we said, um, send us your ideas for a skill, uh, a plugin, an extension, a thing that these home assistants could do, and we had a shed load of responses. Oh my god! Yes, yes. loads, <laughs> loads. Thank you. Um, particularly as we had not particularly decipherable instructions from how to submit <laughs> your entry as well. I mean, we spent a good. Five minutes exploring the easiest way for you to send in your entry. So thank you for bearing with us. Yes, um, you did a very good job. Yeah. So, so what we've got is we thought we'd um, we've picked some of the best ones and we thought we'd immortalise them in the show. Ooh. Yeah, but we haven't picked a winner, so we're going to talk about that on air. Yes. Um, so should we just go through these? Should I start? Yeah, we should. And for Jenny's. those of you that we can't read them all because we did get way more than we anticipated. But if you suggested something that they already do and have done for years. We're not reading those ones either. We got quite a few that <laughs> right. we all read and thought, well, it just, it already does that. Right. All right. So Jenny M- Matheson, uh, I was listening to the show with my other half last night. I came up with a ridiculously niche idea. I'd like Alexa to be my lab assistant. See, I'm a conservator. Uh, she fixes old shit for museums and she needs to keep notes on what to do uh, on the, op- with the objects on a workbench at a time. Be great if I could, Rig it up to take notes for me, uh, such as a voice recording, a little bit like they do in a morgue, and then transcribe it as they go with treatment reports. Cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. I right. mean, uh, she, wants, she wants to know whether it's running now on toluene, and your answer if you're running now on toluene is, don't buy any more toluene. It's horrible stuff. Just don't have it. <laughs> Next one, um, ben, ben Thorpe, um, friend of the show and of previous shows. <laughs> um, Many, yeah. But, Long yeah. time. Uh, and and he made that point by also sending uh, his, his his suggestion to show at lugradio dot org, which to that's my, negative negative point. Yeah, but to my delight, it doesn't yeah. work apparently. <laughs> so well, I <laughs> fix that. Oops. Yep. But he said, um, "I'd like to be able to say something like Alexa, how can I watch some TV program, and have it tell me the availability of the media on digital platforms with prices, so he could say." Um, uh, I want to watch this film, and it'll tell you, is it on Amazon, is it on Google Play, is it on Prime Video, Netflix, Now TV, sporting events, everything. There is literally zero chance that Alexa is going to build in a thing which advertises stuff on Google Play and vice versa. Right. <laughs> but yeah. it would be a really good cool. idea if this sort of thing were Mycroft to exist. Would. Mycroft could. I think that'd be good Mycroft for Mycroft absolutely yeah. could do. And this is the kind of thing where Mycroft can actually steal a march on the competition because they haven't got a back-end service to sell. Yeah. True. Good idea, Ben. Good, uh, good luck with the pronunciation of this, Jeremy. Uh, the next one is from Tuka, who said, Alexa, <laughs> Tuka, who no, wants Tuka to be who? able to say, Alexa, let me tu- try tu- a Linux distribution, and Alexa will provision a virtual machine on my home server, download said distro, and install it, which I think would be pretty cool. It's a bit niche, but I, uh, Jeremy, uh, there's a lot of Tukas in the world. What's Tuka's last name? I'm unfortunately not sure. <laughs> tu- Can you have a go? Tuka P. Tuka's last name? Tuka P. <laughs> took a pee. I, you take a pee. I take a pee. You took a pee. Um, that's a very, very niche idea. I don't know if I think that's very interesting personally. All right, can we move on? We can. Thank you, Tuka. Richie Delaney. My idea is for an event system based around milestones, small or big. A few use cases that make this a little clearer. Uh, milestones can be vague or times in the future, such as Alexa. Remind me to move over my bank addresses once we move house. Um, uh, uh, Alexa, we've moved house, and then the thing happens, you know? So I think that's a really cool idea. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that yeah. entirely. Very good, Richie. Um, right. Now, Russell Hay and about 50 other people also uh, emailed us to say, right, clearly the needed skill is Alexa, organize a bad voltage competition, and then it tells you all the details so you don't get them all wrong. Shut up. All of you people who said this. <laughs> fine. <laughs> fine. I screwed up the announcement. I'm sorry. Whatever. You didn't all have to make the point. <laughs> I hate you all. Thanks a bunch. Cheers. Next. And we have Alex Wilmer, who I will guess is a giant Emacs fan, said, my suggestion for the competition, Alexa, quit my VI session. (laughs) I just... (laughs) To be fair, uh, there was a thing recently where... um, uh, Where is it? I'm just digging up right now. That uh, something like half a million people regularly... Uh, ask on Stack Overflow how to quit Vi- how to quit Vim, 
So this could arguably be a pretty, you know, significant use case. Nah, you see, so I quite you, like you that. You get, um, you know, high marks for impact for implementing that, I suspect. There you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, all right, Mark Johnson, uh, a voice communication app. So you would say, Alexa, I want to speak to Jono, and it would... Uh, oh, no, I'm reading... No, never mind, Mark. That's not got hashes next to it. No. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> we'll skip over you. You won't, no, Thank Mark. you anyway. Um, oh, Jesus. Uh, Tadeus? Tadeus Cantwell. Uh, my skills idea is probably a magic fairy dust, but someone with a speech impediment attempting to use Google now is very frustrating as it doesn't understand me even when I try to slow down. Um, one thing I've noticed is that people who are in sales, the police force or in healthcare, have to have a certain voice that they use to communicate with. So they set the tone and don't engage in blah, 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 blah. My skill idea is that uh, one that recognizes a person attempts at speech and communicates back in a practice way that encourages the person with the impediment to have a conversation with that person. So it, I think that's a really yeah. Good I mean, essentially, sort of speech therapy, but done by yeah. by by the thing electronic. I think that's a really good idea, actually. And, and it, yeah, I love. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I just love how like how much creativity you guys have all you know shared here. It's really cool. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, right. What's right, next? Uh, Yelma Prince um, wrote in, along with loads and loads of other people, again, and said, hey, here's an idea. Well, how about every time you say lug radio, it corrects you and says, did you mean bad voltage? Yes, I know. Shut up mm. again. <laughs> None of you are funny. I hate you all. <laughs> we did it for a while. It's just a bit of the brain that's <laughs> locked. Yeah, for three and a half years. I know. It's, it's right. longer than that, man. <laughs> last, lug radio, last lug radio show was in 2009. <laughs> What episode is this? It's like 96 of Bad Voltage or something? Yeah. Yeah, 94. Right. Anyway. I think it's really worrying. Rapidly bearing down yeah. on 100 we are. I know. Next. Yeah. Who's next? So Daniel uh, Alexanderson <laughs> said, my skill suggestion is something that would help me manage my diabetes. So a current glucose trend, he would check out his glucose level in the first thing in the morning before he went to bed and before he would leave the house. So, so he, he wanted to be able to say, Bezos, how's my glucose level looking? And be reassured that the last measurement was X six minutes ago and has remained stable for the last two hours. That, yeah. that seems to be got that Good kind idea. of integration with health stuff. Isn't there, um, what's it called? Uh, Benjamin Currents' thing. Glucosio. Glucosio. Yes. Glucosio. That's the one. So um, yeah. it, it seems like there are kind of free software services out there you can integrate with, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Stephen Ward could be good or silly idea. Some kind of psychologist app that can describe your problems and dreams, and it gives advice based upon the database it's got access to. Uh, of course, the cynical developer might have it repeat your questions back to you. What does it mean to be Alexa? What do you think it means? Um, so, it'd be interesting as AI gets better and better. You know, if if there is some light psychology there, this could be a dangerous path. The, the, but the idea, cool, it's the, cool idea. The idea that you take Eliza and port it to Alexa is just brilliant, I think. <laughs> oh, that's such a superb idea. <laughs> yeah. But um, Frank, Frank Doignan, Dugnan, I'm not sure. Um, he says, uh, a music tutor that will help you or your children learn to play an instrument. It will listen to your progress and provide feedback and suggestions as necessary. I think, I mean, I love that. You, could, you could have a thing that's which... That's a super good one. You could have a thing which just reads through... Um, you know, uh, single simple pieces of tiny fingers or my first 20 guitar lessons or whatever. But the idea that it can actually listen to your playing and dynamically work out what's wrong and tell you would be really difficult. And I'm not sure, and I don't think it's possible with digital. There's di already services that do uh, that. Not on digital assistants as they currently stand. You can't capture arbitrary audio and listen to it on the server side, right? Speaking as a developer. So developer. every time you play, you'd have to say, Alexa, listen or something. Yeah. Um, well, no, the point is that you can't do that at the moment. You can't have it listen to audio and pass you the audio. The Alexa service yeah. get, oh, interprets text the... and then just sends you text. Right. So it, it, oh, it, it yeah, would yeah. need an enhancement. But an awful lot of the suggestions we had can't be done currently. This is a really sure. good idea. I think. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a, and there's already, I forget it is, they have constantly advertising YouTube videos. There's already a service, um, musician, musician, and they do something. Similar. Okay. Uh, and um, our, our final one, which went on our list that we really it, liked. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, Maddie Williams, and this is probably a lol as in American or uh, maybe as a non British, but maybe not so much for Stuart, is a skill to tell you whether it's a good idea to call a snap general election. <laughs> I, I I would be more than happy to implement this. You know, you know, um, you've got all these websites which say things like "is learning about choice" and there's just the word "no" in massive writing. It would just be that as a skill, right? <laughs> okay, so um, there were lots of. So other first, let me say thank you for everyone that submitted one. We only probably read 
maybe one in five or ten. So, we, like yeah. I said, we did get a yeah. ton of, of submissions. Yes. But what yep. do you? So, what do you guys think? Should we, it's tough. Should we have a? Oh, no. What, what do you think? Should we have a vote? I'm I'm torn between two. Okay. No, that's fair. Yeah. Um. So I think I'll I'll, I'm, I'll tell I'm, you what I'm, I think, and yeah. then you uh, you yeah. guys fill in yours. So the th- all right, you go first. Um, I looked a bunch of. I, I, have, I, I have a bad feeling that I'm stuck between the two, and John is going to vote for one, and you're going to vote for the other, <laughs> well, knowing your personalities. Well, I um, a lot of them I think are really good ideas and so on, but the one I'd actually use, the one I I would use it ten times a day, every day, is Richie Delaney's suggestion, the milestones one. Um, Alexa, remind me after I move house to change all my addresses. And then you go, Alexa, I have moved house two months later. And it goes, ah, oh, okay, this is the stuff you need to do. I'd use that all the time, my God. So that's that, the one I want. That was, that was indeed one of my two. <laughs> and a famed musician, John O'Bacon, which one did you like? Because I suspect I, I, it is uh, the other one I liked. I, I like the uh, Rich Delaney's one. Um, it's just a bit boring, isn't it? You know? And I don't. Th- I think I'd forget to use it. Um, I do like the um, the guitar teacher one. Uh, who was that again? I forget. Uh, hang on, where is it? That was really Frank, Frank, wasn't it? Frank Dugan. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think that's really. I like how creative that is. Uh, and I got a bit of a lol out of Alex Wilmer's uh, "How to Quit Vim." <laughs> <laughs> so I. I like Rich, I like Frank, and I like Alex. Those would be my three. So congratulations, Frank and uh, Rich. We're going to cut the endless in half and uh, get one half of it. Yeah, one of you's getting the box. <laughs> right, no, no. <laughs> right, hang on, King Solomon Garcia. That's not how it works. Speaking as a guy who has to actually take a hacksaw to the thing, man up and pick one. <laughs> it would be... Hilarious if we did actually <laughs> saw it in half and send it though, wouldn't it? No. I know you'd have to pay double postage, but, but yeah, I think we should seriously consider this for a moment. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't not cut it in half. I'll say that. <laughs> no, we're not. it would be such a bad voltage competition, Brian. We've got half of an endless. <laughs> Oh, anyway, no, I know. Uh, and, 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 and then it arrives, and people are like, "It's not so endless after all." It turns out, I can't even get it to turn <laughs> on. <laughs> you get the end, and he gets the less. <laughs> so, Jeremy, were they the two that you were caught in between? They were, in fact. Ah, yes. so you get to be the decider. So, whoever doesn't win this, it's Jeremy's fault that you have no computer. <laughs> so, I genuinely think they're both really, really good. I don't want to pick one. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip a coin. Oh, good call. Uh, what about Eeny, Meeny, Miny, so, Mo? Here's a coin. I'll tell you what, right? Um, somewhere, right. while he's flipping coins, somewhere on my list of things I've meant to do since I was a kid is count how many syllables there are in the eeny, meeny, miny, mo rhyme so I could just know where to start. And I've never Actually, got to do so, <laughs> so we could do this on the air. It'd be even more fun. Doesn't, do either, of, are either of you in a room with one of these devices? Uh, I'm in a room with a Mycroft. What? Uh, no, but do you have your phone that has a Google Assistant on it? Ah, you do. Yes, John. Can, I'm, can I'm you flip a, a virtual a... coin? Well, it will say out loud which one. Oh, I think so. Yeah, All right, so we'll do uh, the milestone one is heads and the guitar is tails. Yep, okay. Right. And we will actually yep. use the assistant to pick. Let's see if this works. Okay, hang on. Flip a coin. Sure. Ooh. It's heads. Heads it is. <laughs> Excellent. You got That's quite cool that you did that. <laughs> that is actually really cool. So two things are important. First of all, um, okay, Google, how much money has Jono got in his bank account? And secondly... <laughs> Stop now. <laughs> se- Stop now. <laughs> secondly... You can just go and find my shoebox if you want to know that, by the way. <laughs> secondly, Richie Delaney, thank you very much. You have won our competition. <laughs> yeah, good yeah. work, Richie Delaney. So that's brilliant. So, and just to... Uh, uh, follow up with... Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so Stuart will follow up with you for I, I will, I will send you an email, stuff. and as soon as you get the skill written, I will send you your endless... <laughs> 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 doesn't work that way no no um if, if cool. someone did like that that would be really brilliant but yes um uh i have one more small piece of news Ooh, which okay. is um on the subject of uh uk conferences since i was at one uh there's another one og camp um which has been running for many years now um uh free software conference um uh, pay what you want tickets to get in. Um, the description is it's an unconference celebrating free culture, hardware hacking, digital rights, collaborative cultural stuff, whatever. Go to ogcamp.org. It is on the 19th and 20th of August in Canterbury. 
So I'm mm. probably going to be there. A whole bunch of other people are going to be there. Um, so it'd be a laugh. Come along. Have a couple of beers. Yeah, and, 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 th- and that ends the regular Stuart Langridge advertising. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> um, which conference are you going to that you want to tell people about? That seems like a useful thing that uh, if people want to see you speak. Where should they go? Um, I'm going to be running a conference, the Open Community Conference, which is going to be part of the Open Source Summit, which is going to be in LA in September, and then also in Prague in October. Nice. Those are a little far um, out, though. Yeah, those are the yeah far out, man. What's the um, difference between what's I'm the difference between to... that and CLS? CLS is a non-conference, and this one's going to be more of a traditional kind of like sharing information about how to build good communities. Thing. Cool. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be fun. Thank you to the Linux Foundation for helping me to put this together. It's going to be a good time. So, um, how about you, Jeremy? I don't think I'm attending any conferences before the next show, so I'm not going to announce something six months out like that. <laughs> yeah, wise. Wise. Uh, but that, that is safe. a good idea, actually. For, <laughs> we, we all attend quite a few conferences, so we probably should be better about saying which ones will be at and try to get some people to come out and say hello. Yeah. Yes. Good idea, Eric. Good idea. Yes. Good idea as part of your shilling. <laughs> I, do, is, I do what I can. Which is both a term and a coin. <laughs> I like that coin thing. That's really good, actually. Yeah, that, 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 that was worked quite out good. quite nice, actually. <laughs> it does impress me. And that was my Google Pixel, by the way, which is the live. Oh, oh um, so how did you fix it? it? Uh, I sent it back to Google and sent me a new one. <laughs> wow. You're such, <laughs> Thank you, Google. You're such a good engineer. I'm impressed. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it was, you know, it's it's difficult to be this great. And on that bombshell, <laughs> we're going to go, because I need to leave in five minutes, and we haven't done an intro yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you very much. Behind the We've magic. been bad voltage. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Just a little window into the bad voltage recording process. 